we could welcome back to the stage Dr. Trinova. So what's going to happen is I am just going to start with a couple of general questions and then here's actually our opportunity in just amongst us all in this room you can ask some questions. So what I'm going to do is uh, organize and I cannot see them at the moment but we'll we'll organize some mic runners wonderful and uh, you can ask some very poignant and pertinent questions for Dr. Trinova. I just want to point out this is my first glass of wine since I arrived. I didn't dare. I didn't dare jet lag and wine before the oration but now I'm done. Um, so this is going to be a livelier conversation. This is going to be the real stuff, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, look, now that you've done, done the big, big oration, the public thing, we can just talk about all, all the stuff you really want okay. to talk about. Yeah, <laughs> great, great, great. Wonderful. So uh, you do these big talks all the time, obviously. And then I'm sure you get asked these sort of scenarios. What is a question that you've always wanted to uh, be asked but never got asked in all those experiences? Ooh. Um, where did you get outfit from? <laughs> uh. <laughs> did you see her rocking shoes at the... At the <laughs> yeah, I love design and I love clothes, so maybe if I was in a biomedical engineering, I would be in fashion, I think. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the question. So, Dr. <laughs> Trianish, uh, Trianova Fashionista. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, in terms of your research over the, the many years, what would you say is something that surprised you along the way? Um, what surprised me? So, um, well, this is a, in a way, this is very personal, but no matter how successful you are, it always surprised me that I am successful. It's always surprised me. I'm like, how come this is happening? You know, this is what's called the imposter syndrome when we all have it, or majority of us do, and you try to suppress it. But that's always the biggest surprise. Wow, I, oh, oh, I did it. Oh, wow. How come they're inviting me to this oration? It's very surprising. So, yes, that's, that's what is surprising. Wonderful. <laughs> I mean, you're clearly a wonderful communicator. I saw your slides and I thought, all oh, this might go over my head, and then it didn't. Great. And I think that's a, it's an accolade to her talent as a, as a great communicator of science and technology. I think we can all learn something from that in terms of how do we make something that's, something that's unseen and very personal, yet so accessible and understandable. I think it's a, a unique attribute, so I really want to acknowledge you for that. Well, I love... I actually do like public speaking. I uh, research public speaking. I, um, I do believe that scientists do have sort of should be, should be doing that because how do you communicate your research results to the general public? You need to do that. And, and COVID is an example how important science it is and the communications of scientific results to the general population. So I do believe that we all need to do that. And I, uh, I really take pride in making my students really focus on that. So every time that somebody in my lab will have a presentation, I would sit there and say, give me this talk as if you are giving it to your grandmother. And that's it. If you pass that, you can go to the stage after that at the meeting and present. So I, I do believe this is a personal conviction that, that I do need to be presenting uh, you know, and explaining what we are doing and how we are bringing that to the clinic in general. Otherwise, you know, it, it may not be understood. Yeah, I'm sure. And I'm sure you also meet in your journey some quite remarkable and well-regarded people. But in your mind, who is an unsung hero? Who have you met who thought, wow, they're doing some extraordinary things. I, you know, they deserve much more recognition. This is also, again, something that is really touches deeply to my experience um, as a woman in science, as a, so as a foreigner, as a person who has no pedigree, who ends up in the US, and then 
lake, trying to overcome the fact that I don't have mentorship, that I have been, you know, I work by myself and try to find everything um, along the way. So to me, the, yeah, I'll, I have met a lot of women, including today at lunch, that have that experience. And that experience can be very discouraging. And to me, women who have succeeded despite that, and whether they have received the recognition or not, to me, they're the unsung hero. Just meeting people with personal stories like that, um, it is, I mean, seriously gives me chills. I had so many women come to me today and say, I had the same experience. It is incredible to know you're not alone and the, the, the obstacles that you have to overcome are obstacles that are, I wouldn't want to say universal, but exist. And just knowing that you could do it, it's actually really important. And the fact that, that I can share that experience with people, I really want to share it. I want to convince people that you can, you can really come a long way. You just keep on doing it, right? So that's, that's really what keeps me going. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Um, I uh, met your husband just, just uh, at the conclusion of tonight's meeting, and maybe I might add, if that's okay, uh, the partners of all the great people who support them through this journey, <laughs> thick and thin, and I think your husband is, is definitely one of those people as well. Yes, I mean, yes. Uh, my husband is an economist. I think he's had his head down. <laughs> he says, you should not tell people that I'm an economist. <laughs> his faith in the profession. Um, yes, no, he's been extraordinarily supportive in all my career, extraordinarily. Um, so, honey, are you blushing? You are. Okay. <laughs> yes, extraordinarily. Uh, you know, I... I I used to live out of a suitcase before COVID. I traveled so much all the time. I get a lot of invitations to present. And, you know, it isn't easy. You, you hardly see each other. But he has been so supportive of me, um, you know, as somebody that I can, you know, share a lot of the experiences and he would understand what I mean. It's really an amazing thing to have a partner like that. So I wish everybody you know, that you find whatever soulmate of that sort that, that can help you in the journey. Yes, to the, all the husbands, wives and partners out there, <laughs> yeah. we want to recognize yeah. you. Um, we actually have some questions from the field, I believe. So if you've got a question, maybe put your hand up, we'll get a mic to you and we can ask a question. So I see one there. I have a, a rather personal question. As a person who had atrial fibrillation, uh, which was corrected, I now take beta blockers twice a day perhaps for the rest of my life. Should I keep doing that or should get I an ablation. <laughs> no, get an ablation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. I think so. The doctor yeah. is in. I mean, the clinical, the clinical studies show that. It is, it, newest research shows it actually is better to do that, to do ablation than just stick with the antiarrhythmics for all your life. Great, That's thank all. you. Yeah. We have a question down the back, and then we'll come back to the front. Uh, hi, everyone. My name's Liz Boyce, and uh, I'm from Piper Alderman. We're delighted to be here and sponsoring a table. And thank you for your presentations at lunch and now. You talked a lot about collaboration and this the incredible investment you made in, I suppose, winning the trust of clinicians Correct. to what you had to offer. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of people in this room who've developed cutting-edge technology that doesn't necessarily sell itself. How do you magnify that? Like, you've got that recognition in one little pocket of the world. How do you magnify that many, many times so that people all around the world can benefit from this technology? By being invited to durations. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I mean, I talk about that a lot. I really talk about that. People all the time ask me, how did you do that? How did you manage to do that? And it is really important to, to share the experience. I, I do believe my experience is unique. I, I was telling you how, you know, how I, I do believe that engineers and um, researchers who work with the clinicians should not expect the clinicians to meet them 
you know, halfway in their research. You know, we are trying to help patients being treated better, so we want to go all the way to understand the clinical language and to be able to communicate with our clinical collaborators. It's very important. I, um, you know, I was talking about that today. I go to a lot of clinical meetings. I am very often the only um, engineer presenting at the clinical meeting. And the interest is tremendous. They all want to do that. It's just that very often they they also, they, clinicians are also frustrated. I talked to engineers today who are frustrated because the clinicians don't want to pay attention to the innovative technology. It goes the other way. The clinicians have tell me, you know, I, people don't listen to me. The engineers don't want to listen to me. It is, you got to listen. You got to, you got to try to find a way to sort of embed yourself in the clinical world because that's where the treatment is, sorry. We have to do that if, if, as engineers if we want to help. So that's the way to go. Just commit to that. Commit to that. It's, Great. Uh, that's my message. Wonderful. We have a question up the front, and then I'll move there and then down there. Hi, it's Stephen O'Leary. I, I trust I have lived a similar journey from the clinician side yeah. as, a, as a chair of laryngology at the University of <coughs> Melbourne. But I'm really curious to know how is it that an engineer develops such a palpable passion for cardiology? I mean, how did that happen? When did you commit to it? And finally, a, a kind of obtuse but also related question. How is it that you've designed fantastic algorithms? I mean, that, they were your words, right? They were smart algorithms. Now, I think there's a real I said story awesome. there. awesome. Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm no. sorry, I undersold it. <laughs> but I think this is probably a story there too that may be related. Um, so how did I develop a passion? Um, well, I generally have a passion for research. Um, also, I'm a passionate person in terms of you have a goal and I'm really, really going to go after it and passionate about that. I like, I like the heart a lot because it's such, a, it's such an essence of the human body, and, um, but also it's, um, it, it's very interesting the way it functions. To me, it's like it's, a, it's, a, it's an orchestra of things. You know, the cells communicate to each other, and the organ responds together as an emergent phenomenon, if you will. So I've been always fascinated by that. So, and I don't know whether I was as, as passionate about it in my earlier years, but the more I moved towards the clinic, the more passionate I became. And it is the encounter of human life and how you make decisions that impact people in a massive way. So that makes you even be more passionate. It's like, oh my God, it is amazing what is happening. And if I can do that, this is, it's sort of so rewarding, and I think passion comes from the feeling of being so rewarding what you do. So, um, what was your other question? <laughs> How is it that you, what is it that drove you or has enabled you to develop amazing algorithms? Having good people in the lab, having amazing people. Look. Let me put it that way, I'm privileged. I work at Johns Hopkins. I work in the Department of Biomedical Engineering, which is the number one biomedical engineering department in the country, and it's been number one for 30 years. You know, it's an amazing program. The amount, the people that come, you know, apply to be my PhD students or other, you know, in other professors, they're staggering. All what I want to do is like, Oh my God, you're so good, I want to have you. It's really, I mean, so, the, so my role is, I am, you know, I understand how to channel things. I understand how, what is innovative. I understand how to make the impact. But the raw talent is the people who come through my lab. I am immensely grateful. It's like, all what I want to do is bring them to the fountain of knowledge. You know, it's like, they're just, they're amazing. I, I can't tell you how, how grateful I am to the people who have come through my lab, with, who continue. Some of them are like my friends for life. 
Um, it's, I, I treat my people as a family. I believe in their careers. I want to make the, I am very good at making the best of what they could be while they're PhD. I promote them being visible. I make them publish in nature, you know, like I know how to do it. I know how to channel that. But the real innovation most likely comes from extraordinary smart students. Hmm? How many people are in your lab? Um, it, it changes, depends on like funding cycles and stuff. COVID, I took a hit during COVID because people like I had a number of international researchers who decided they can't be in the US during COVID, what are they doing, so went back. So um, right now I think I have like 15 or 16 people, but normally it's more. Like it was 33 a couple of years ago, so it just depends. Um, you know, it depends on funding right. also. So it is, I would like to have more. Um, Machine learning people, if you're really interested, if anybody knows anybody who really wants to come work with me and do machine learning, oh my goodness, tell them to apply. <laughs> yeah, if that's not tempting. I don't know what it is. I think we had a question <laughs> over this direction. Hello. Um, so my name's Jamie Lee, and I'm from the Eye and Ear Hospital um, in Melbourne here, where the marvelous Graham Clark did his first cochlear implant. Um, and I just have a comment um, which goes back prior to Stephen's question around the clinician. Um, and, and my recommendation is, and you talked to it beautifully during your oration, is connect with the clinicians. Ask them what their problems are and then help them solve them. It all comes back to teamwork. And I think that, you know, that was the, the take home message. I thoroughly enjoy um, the way you talk to promoting women in STEM. That's amazing. but. You, this is where we have this big gap. You know, researchers need to connect with clinicians, and clinicians need to connect with researchers. And together is really how we how we really help you know, exactly, the human yeah. race, the you know the planet, and things like that. It's only with that connection. So thank you so much. You're very welcome. But I also wanna I wanna also emphasize another point. Um, I don't think engineers should be necessarily um, addressing the clinician's needs because none of what we do came from the clinician's needs. It was us who told the clinicians what could be done. It is a little bit of a different approach where the engineers, you know, what we were doing, it was so out of the view of the clinical practice that they couldn't suggest that. It was us suggesting that and being in a way the driving force. And I think that's what I pride myself the most, that I brought the clinicians with me rather than us doing addressing their needs, which you also do, but the important part is the innovation that we do, we did it in such a way and we convinced them so we brought them with us. So that's a little bit different from, from that perspective. Natalia, I have to ask, over here. Down that way. Oh yeah, I see you. Where did you get that outfit? Oh, um, <laughs> um, in New York. In, um, yeah, I like fashion, uh, yes. <laughs> Are you wondering the whether shoes, you... it's called uh, Fluval. It's a, um, um, it's actually a Dutch company that has stores. You want me to talk more about fashion? I can talk about fashion. <laughs> he wants to know if it's well, in his size. Well, I just size. want to indulge you in your, um, <laughs> in, in your favorite question. But um, the question I wanted to ask is where do you see wearable technologies coming into this uh, equation? Right. Wearable technologies are extraordinarily important. For instance, in... Uh, um, you know, in cardiac electrophysiology, um, you know, the electrical function of the heart. A lot of, um, a lot of effort has been put into using uh, wearable technology, particularly, and using deep learning on the signals that are recorded by, by our um, eye watches or Fitbits. Um, that has made, there was the Apple Watch trial, um, it has made huge inroads. Actually, the Mayo Clinic in the US was at the forefront of doing that. Basically, they managed to even connect signals that come from wearable devices to the 
a patient's electronic records. So the doctor can pull that and make a you know, recommendation or decision based on that. I think it will be very important. In my field, it's been mostly from recording ECGs from the, you know, from the devices, but um, you, you, any, any wearable signals, they absolutely. Um, this is going to happen. That is a trend that's very strong and, and will be the future. Thank you for a really inspiring talk just here. Of this direction. Hi. No, right, I right guess. <laughs> Behind the banister. Oh, she's, got you. She's... Okay. So let's imagine we're in a near future and your technology is being rolled out around the world to treat heart patients. What do you think is, what are the biggest bottlenecks for you to see that happen? Is it cloning your amazing imaging specialist? Is it convincing surgeons around the world that this is possible? Or is it your tech transfer office? What, what is the biggest barrier? I mean, it's all of it. All of it. I, you know, I talk about stuff, but, you know, I talked about my research today, but I, I was talking to people, the fact that I, you know, all the time I file disclosure, I have patents, I have a lot of patents, I have a startup, I have a uh, um, license by patents, um, I was inducted in the uh, National Academy of Inventors in the US. I do a lot of, you have to do a lot of that. As you can see, it's a whole range of things and you cannot drop any ball. All of it has to go simultaneously. I think, um, you know, having a clear, you know, intellectual property space is very important. You don't want people to encroach on your technology. I, I really keep an eye on that and very much am on top of that. But what uh, I also like the fact that my students are part of it. Um, like every patent that I have filed, I have students on it in equal portions. It's not like I'm the main inventor. I have everybody. We are five people. We all have 20% of the patent or something like that. It's very important to sort of bring the younger generation into that space as well so they can, you know, as you go forward, you can do everything together. Pioneering in so many ways. It's extraordinary here. Thank you for that. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, right down here. Oh, um, hello there. Um, Hi. What do you see are the biggest challenges facing women in science today, and how can the system change to address them? How much time do you have? Ah. I think it's an important <laughs> issue. <laughs> um, I talked about that at lunch today. Um, so, at least in the US, there has been a lot of push to recognize, push towards diversity, equity, and inclusion, and women, um, that we have had a lot of new um, young faculty women, at least in my department, and I see that throughout. Um, one of the biggest battles for me has been how women progress in their career. So it's really seems it's easier right now to get a faculty position, at least in the US, as female that it used to be. But what happens as you go up the ladder um, is another question. So it becomes increasingly different, um, increasingly more difficult as you go up. And um, so I have devoted a lot of years on working um, on recognition and understanding the problems of women leaders because there are so few female leaders. So to me, the short answer to your question is, how can we make more women leaders? How we can create that milieu that supports women leaders? There aren't that many. And um, um, it is, a, again, a unique challenge because when you get to the top, the feeling is very different. It's like, how come you ended up there, seriously? So, um, bringing awareness of that and working with the leadership at the university has been one of my really very important tasks in the, the last few years. A recognition of that problem of, of senior women and lack thereof. Thank you, really important question. That's all we have time for for this part of our segment. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank, Thank you. you. Really enjoyed the discussion. Please give another round for Dr. Trinova. Yes, everybody. Yeah, enjoy the evening.